system. She was coming. Okay. Well, Dale is a sweetie pie from way back when, and she can just talk in. Okay. All Dale, right. Dale doesn't. Dale knows us too well. I prefer not to introduce myself in front of Dale. There might be. I, I, I'd like her to have a good opinion of me. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, thank you all for uh, okay. for coming as always. Uh, we we have here uh, uh, for our education and entertainment, I think as well. Uh, and education, education, and delectation, <laughs> yeah, uh, illumination. Uh, the uh, guys behind On Bunker Hill and uh, many of the other things we, we looked at the 1947 project, one of their older uh, uh, concepts. Uh, uh, Nathan and Richard. And, uh, and uh, okay, I can pull up your website. Yeah, on bunkerhill.org forward slash George Mann. First of all, if this, is, this is my wife in the corner, Kim, and this is all her fault. Okay, everything behind 1947 Project, sir. Okay, she thought of it. She thought of it. I was George eight. Mann and then. Double N's. Double N. Double U. She has her hand like this. Up it. It's true. It's true. I was getting my degree in computer science in 2004, Cal State LA, and my degree in art history in the mid 80s, where I met Nathan and my wife. My wife and I hated each other in college, couldn't stand each other. My wife was so, my wife couldn't even go to class. Okay, take, take note from my wife, who's a genius. Okay, she had this professor, Jasper, who was from Cambridge. He just wrote on pieces of paper, she's taking classes with me. And she lived at his house, and he just graduated. It was great. You should fall early. Okay, she never went to class. She would go to class with Nathan and I in her history, and she would say, "No way. I'm not. No. Uh-uh. I can't do that. This this professor is stupid. It's great." And I couldn't stand her. And she thought I wore beanies. And 18 years later, Nathan reintroduced us, and we got married. And right before we That's got married, I, I was getting my degree in computer science at Cal State LA, and I decided to write a blog engine for her. And it failed, and we had a big fight. So I put her on WordPress. And she had access to ProQuest, the newspaper archives for the LA Times at um, LA at UCLA, because my, my father, the extremely difficult individual that he is, was on a, a medical school there, and we had access to the newspapers. And she start, and you said, I want to prove my thesis. My thesis for my book is that 1947 is the seminal year for Los Angeles, right? So if you can give me access to LA Times, the LA Times from 1947, I can do this blog, a crime a day. It's a start. It's a start. And then Nathan, you, you just do what she tells you to. So, so, she, so she told you to drive down all over South Los Angeles, taking photos of bookie joints and murder scenes. And breaking into junior high schools because they have a really good tile. And, uh, <laughs> Southgate. Cudahy. Oh, Cudahy, yeah. Yeah, Compton and Watts. Yeah. But, um, you want to say, or shall I? Shall okay. I yeah. Yes, so. Can, we um, scroll, oh, can I scroll this down so we can get the noir photo? Do we go, get started, Nathan. So, so, yes, by, by further way of introduction, my name is Nathan Marsak, and I met Kim, and we were at UC Santa Cruz, and it was famously, you know, we were, we were deep, you know. That's a very noir photo. Yeah, and we were deep in the days of. Uh, I, I, I think one of the things we're going to be talking about, you know, prime. Ultimately, historiography is about the delineation between primary and secondary sources. And a yeah. lot of what we were doing here is source work. Um, you know, everything in Santa Cruz at the time was, of course, you know. And, and time frame, we were at Santa Cruz in the mid 80s. Yeah, mid 80s. We were studying so the Rainer Manna. Micro histories. Yep. And um, as such, you know, it was all, you know, and of course, we're the children of Benjamin. Yes. Uh, and, but, you know, Eventually, you learn to reject historical materialism, and of course, it always made my professors completely insane. And I would say, no, I'm going to do like ranking historicism, and uh, you know, Leopold von Rank, of course, is very, you know, so you're, which is all about primary sources, and that's what I learned is primary sources, people. That being said, when we started looking at ProQuest, the LA Times, to do all this sort of stuff, do we consider the Los Angeles Times a primary source? Some would say yes. Some would say no. Newspapers lie. Are you not? Yeah. And then what is the LA Times? It is the you know the Chandler-esque version of things. You have the first papers. These are all things we're going to discuss today. Yep. So that's why we're here. Richard, what are we looking at? Uh, this is George Mann's wife. This is just a great noir photo. I thought we'd get started with it and then move into Bunker Hill photos of George sure. Mann. Yeah. What's his wife's name, Kim? Barbara Bradford. Barbara Bradford. Ha ha cha cha cha. <laughs> friends with the three I do it she told me to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
So yeah, starting with newspapers is a really good idea, right? You, so you guys have done that, right? You looked at the California Eagle, 1943. You yeah, looked at... Yeah, 47. 47. So, so you know... Here at school? It's at archive.org. The, uh, oh, good. Yeah. Uh, the, the Eagle, yeah, good. You, you, UCLA just digitized their entire run of it and put it up on archive.org. Oh, good for them. So it's just the JPEGs. So. Good thing to remember when we go there awesome. next week. Awesome. That's fantastic. Uh, so, you know, you start by reading the newspapers. And that's really good. Um, so the difference between what we do and say what we would do if we were PhD candidates, right, in history, I mean that's a good place to start in this classroom. Um, I think that the better part of a PhD doctoral candidacy is your question, right? You have to ask a really good question. You have to come up with a really good question and I think this has helped us ask a better question. Right. Um, right. And, and we're not trying to get, uh, get a degree or get tenure, so we have a little more leeway. But I think starting with the newspapers, acknowledging that the newspapers are not always true, you start to look at these threads and you start to connect a bunch of stuff. And Kim, what happens when you have children of victims writing to the blog about stories that are in the blog? Well, I mean, it gives you a sense of real responsibility for bringing these stories back into the Googleable world. We've had multiple incidents of people who were personally connected to 60-year-old crimes. They all co always contact me very late at night, and you know that they've been Googling year after year, and they finally found something. And when they do, they reach out, and they just want all the information you have. And in so many cases, uh, it turns out that their parents hid the truth from them. They don't really know what happened. They know something awful happened. It has resonated for all these years, these sort of ripples that move outward. It effect affected their families, whether they were the fact primary victims or just closely associated neighbors, classmates. And there's a sense, I mean, closure is such a charged word, hmm. and there probably is no closure. We talk no, about this a lot. No, there's no closure. But closure. to be able to provide it's the information, I mean, anytime anyone asks, we gather as much as we can. And I've, I've given Nathan the chance to talk to people, too, occasionally. Mm. Um, they want he to know. can behave himself sometimes. They really want to know what happened, and they want to know how you got that information. Did you know them? Can we give it to them? Tell them, tell, the, real fast, just tell uh, the, the uh, Stephen Nash, Bunker Hill. Nathan, set up the Bunker Hill, the story from On Bunker Hill. So this blog, On Bunker Hill, which is, a, which is after 47 Project, you've got this famous incident at the Third Street Tunnel, which is at Third and Hill, 1950. Is it 57? 50, is Kim, is it 50? 58? Okay, 1958, Third and Hill, about 2 in the morning, Nathan, what's happening? Well, Stephen Nash was this character who famously said, you know, I am Caesar, so you already know that he's... <laughs> and, um, you know, he was just a serial murderer, child murderer, uh, mostly out at the beach, but also uh, stabbed, he was, uh, I guess, living at the Elmar, which was on Hope Street, and stabbed a guy in the Third Street Tunnel, because he, I guess, could. Uh, for no other reason than that. And um, one of the, uh, so we were writing about Stephen Nash, and because I would written about the Elmar in some depth and breadth, and one of the uh, like school chums of Larry. Well, we'll let Kim pick it up from here. Larry so, Rice was his child victim. This, this kid was killed underneath the Santa Monica boardwalk. And um, we actually heard from Larry Rice's classmate who had gotten into a physically, physical dispute with him at school. Oh, well, let, let, let me argue with him. So, sure. so we're, we're concerned with narratives here. So Stephen Nash is an American serial killer, very well understood narrative, right? His famous, was this his last killing, the kid, under the boardwalk? Cause the, yeah. Yeah, because they caught him. So very well understood, it is thought. He kills this kid under the boardwalk, they catch him, he confesses, and it's really clear what happened. Everyone now knows, and it's no, James Elroy has written about it. It's canonical. Jack Webb wrote about it. it was Jack Webb. It's it's canonical what happened, okay? And then Nathan publishes this blog post on the On Bunker Hill site, and Kim, this comment shows up. Right, and this young man who's an exact um, classmate, same age. Pure. Pure. Thank you. Of uh, Larry says, "Oh my God, it's haunted me my whole life. We had a fight on, on the playground. The fight was about nothing." I got sent home and my mother, you know, told me I was bad and gave me a ham sandwich. He was sent home. His mother had just died of cancer. He had no one to be with. He went out and screwed around on the pier and met this guy who basically hung out with him all day. 
bought him hot dogs, took him to the throwing range with baseball, and then stabbed him to death. So this, yeah, really, so this really deepens and changes the narrative about Stephen Nash as an America as a serial killer. So and and this this could not necessarily happen if this was a monograph that had been published. You know, mm -hmm. and these are the sort of journal histories that um, someone like Carl Ginsburg would famously say, like these are the sort of tales that you know go into our you know voice of the voiceless micro histories. That's one of the beauties of something like the internet, which you know, of course we're believing this young man. Sorry? We believe that this young man has sent us the sure, truth. Sure, we believe him. Sure. Maybe he isn't. You there could, you, go. You, you could, you could, fly, you, mean, you could go to Piper Tech and look through LAPL, his, the murder book, if you wanted well, to. Well, that, yeah, we Which believe him be because, hard, of course, you could do it. That's, of course, the other first thing any historian learns is you, you know, believe nothing. Um, have we talked about the discerning eye is very difficult. Have we talked about researching LAPD and LASD documents? It's almost impossible unless you're a sworn officer. So that's a whole other problem with researching the history of Los Angeles is that the archives of the law enforcement agencies within the county of Los Angeles are basically inaccessible to the lay public. And that that is a huge problem from an historian's point of view. I mean you just Piper Tech is just this black hole. There's just all this stuff, and James Elroy can go in and, and tell them to pull some photos and write a check to the Police Historical Society, and they show them, but that's, that's all that gets out. So either go to the black. academy, or just become a really big crime writer. Yeah, exactly. So, so the secret then is right to become, well, Joseph Wambaugh was a sworn officer. So was a sworn ally. So, so that's another really important thing to think about, is how do you research the archives of the law enforcement agencies? And... If you think that, uh, I think, oh, something like 20% of the population of Los Angeles is incarcerated at any given moment in the county of Los I'm going to repeat that. And I just heard this from, from a deputy in the LASD. 20% of the population in the county of Los Angeles at any given moment is, incar is incarcerated. Okay, so, so jails are a big part of the culture of Los Angeles. The physical location of jails, the, just the physical space of jails are a huge part of the psyche of the county of Los Angeles. It's, it's a lot. Acquitted. You, anyway. <laughs> Nathan, talk about, ben, talk about Benjamin. Oh. Talk about right, Benjamin. the scrap heap, right? I mean, that's... The, 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 yeah, the, the, the piles of debris. I mean, that's what... Okay, yeah, I, see, I see where you're going with this. Um, so... Right. So someone like, I'm sure you're all familiar with Leopold von Ranke was saying, okay, you know, you go, you go to these primary um, sources, but of course, primary sources, these are the famous 19th century historian, but of course these sources were all, you know, written by the winners, basically. They, they, everything is political and it's about the battles and it's about the kings. And it was sort of, Benjamin was one of the, the early titans, Walter Benjamin, a uh, critic, a social theorist, philosopher, and a historian. And he said, you know, there's this great sort of uh, debris pile of history. And you need to sort of go in there and, and pick at it, you know, pick at pick at the junk. Um, and of course, the arcades project, the last thing we worked on, the last few years, yeah. until, and then you know, and when when they, then they were escaping the Nazis, and he's like, oh, we're never going to escape, and he killed himself, and of course, everybody else escaped, and so be a lesson to you: don't kill yourself because you'll probably just get out anyway. Um, an intelligent guy, not the smartest guy, an intelligent guy. But the point being, what he was really looking at was a and this is what brings, this is what brings me to it because, of course, my background is, is less interested in art history. Uh, my master's is in art history, and that's why I'm so, and I'm a sculptophile. I have to look at everything. Like some people are really into eating, and some people listen to music all the time. I have to look at everything all the time. And Benjamin, especially in his in the Second American Arcade Project, he was looking at history as a as a visual culture, uh, visual nature. And uh, who was it? It was Hayden White. Another great historian, I'm sure. That's Mary. Santa Cruz when we were there. Yeah, Santa, exactly, another Santa Cruz dude. I mean, we, we went to Santa Cruz to go study with Rainer Bannon, who was an architectural historian. Hayden White was, of course, a giant at this time. Can and he, he coined a term which was historiophity. And historiophity is the concept of, how would you explain it, of reading history, not through like historiography, which is about the written word, but through verbal culture. And that has its basis in Benjamin. Um, that's why, you know, when you have these photographic archives, and of course, that's what's really key so much to, oh, 
Greetings. Oh, it's Dale. Yay. Sorry to be late. Sorry to be late. Welcome. She's great. <laughs> yeah. Everyone come in to talk to her, special collections. Good. The whole class came on Oh, that's right. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so that's why, to such a large measure, the the visual nature from, from, from Benjamin to Hayden White to whomever, to yourselves, you know, the, the visual culture, the visual nature of a time period is so important, as is, and that's why you have to learn it to such an extent. That's why you have to look through all the old magazines, to look through the photos, you know, the LAPL up in Sacramento, the Huntington Library, and always, always, always look for something that you haven't found yet and, and no one else has found yet, um, and get a feeling for the time period. In fact, I would go so far as to say, get a feeling for the time period. If you are writing your thesis about the Zulu, uh, and you don't go visit the Zulu, then you are, you'd be seen as nothing more than a dilettante, ultimately. So if you're writing about the past, and you don't go visit the past, what are you writing? You, you know, it's, it's all just, you know, wankery up here. So, therefore, um, I don't know what, eat the food, um, you know, dance the dances, wear the clothes, drive the cars, if you're writing, for example, if you're doing 1947, because these things will help you generate and define the historical imagination. That's where the uh, imagination comes in. Because that's ultimately what writing history is about. It's the confluence between historical fact and you know, the nature of us as uh, imagination, because you, know, you can't travel there. And that's why when something like L.A. Noir comes out, people think they've oh hold up we're, we're done hold, hold on this that's, that's our next traveling time. to the past. No, and then you get to say ah, but this is this is a flawed and disingenuous historiography. Stop. Stop. Okay. <laughs> we're not going to go there. Just Almost. Because then I'll get excited. Almost. You don't want to see me get excited. Stop. That's okay. Week, that's week fifteen of our class. <laughs> Let's stop. Just stop for a second. Okay. So Nathan has talked about two important historians: one architectural, one more strict. Walter Benjamin. This, this great. How many people have heard of Walter Benjamin in this class? Raise your hand. So most people don't know who he is. Okay. Uh, Walter Benjamin, super important uh, secular Jewish intellectual out of Berlin, uh, ended up in Paris right before the Nazis marched in. Really, wow, really important. Go look him up. Um, Rainer Banham wrote this book, Los Angeles, a study of foreign colleges, 1971. Changed the way people thought about Los Angeles. So when people think of talk about Los Angeles being cool now, 1971, Los Angeles was not cool. Okay? Hey, well, like, right, right. Benjamin talking about the debris pile of history. Everybody has considered Los Angeles this vast debris pile, and it was Bainham who said, what a bitchin' debris pile. Nathan Warren Glasser, what a great debris pile. <laughs> so, so Nathan, just, just be, so, so we're, we're, it's now, it's now, it's now, it's 2012. Uh, Web 2.0 is here, syndication, the internet, hypercharged. If Walter Benjamin and Rainer Bannon were sitting in this class, what would they be doing? Well, hopefully they'd be paying attention to us. No, they wouldn't. They, 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 they would be, be, they'd be on their tablets. They would be on their iPads. Texting. That's right. They'd be they on their iPads. They'd be futurists. Yeah. <laughs> the point of this is, is that there has never been a greater time to be in a story. The, the sheer amount of photographic material, of metadata around Los Angeles, around anything you want, is available. And you can dig in. You, you know, it, it used to be, in, in Walter Benjamin's day, Walter Benjamin's, this was Walter Benjamin's, Benjamin's angle. He was lucky. Walter Benjamin made it because his best friend was Georges Bataille, who was this really great pornographic writer. I encourage you all to read him. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Richard, we're in a classroom. <laughs> it's important. Blue of Noon is a yeah. great novel. Yeah. Blue of Noon. <laughs> Great novel. So Georges Bataille was the librarian <coughs> at the Bibliothèque in Paris, and Bataille knew where everything was, and and so Benjamin would go in, and his best friend would, would tell him all the all the good all the good stuff was. You just need a tablet connected to the internet now, and a little and a little and a little feedback from an email from a librarian to start getting the good stuff. Well, conversely, to play devil's advocate, um, when we started doing the Forty Seven Project. And Kim would come up with this. She she would come up with this story. That was our when ProQuest came out. She'd say like, "Oh, there was this like." Crazy when ProQuest came out to people that had access to the UCLA library, who were faculty or students, right? Before you could just like say, "Hey, Nathan, what's the ProQuest link?" And I'd like email it to you. She would say, "There's this crazy guy running with a gun and a whip, and he's naked, and it's on like 109th and Western." And 
go find his house. And I'd be like, and I, you know, this is before you had Google Maps. Mm -hmm. It was like 2005, and I only mm -hmm. Google Maps in like 2007. Mm -hmm. So I would get in my car, and I'd get in the Packard, and I'd mix up some cocktails, and I'd motor down, <laughs> never on the freeway, never drive the freeway, and I'd motor through Los Angeles down 109th and Western, and I'd hang out with the brothers, and I'd talk to them about what was going on down there, and we'd eat barbecue, and I'd drive back up. And it's like, but now, because I could just like go, oh, that's what it looks like. You know, it's not the same. You know. It's not the same. So I feel a little bit, and also, again, don't believe everything. Now people just, people, well, I think it's like Wikipedia. Uh, who was it? Larry, the famous Larry Harnish. Very, very good writer. I don't think they know who Larry Harnish Larry, is. If you ever read, there's a blog called, here I'm talking about like why the internet is bad, and I'm saying go to this blog, but it's this great blog <laughs> written by a guy who's actually a copy editor at the Times Desk, so he's really obsessed with like research. He's very much about where do myths about Los Angeles come from. Uh, one of the favorite things he wrote, uh, my favorite things that he wrote about was the um, thing about like there was this, there was this idea that Harry Chant was it no it was Harrison Gray Otis drove around with a car with a cannon on the front of it. Right. He hated the working people so much he used to shoot them with a cannon. Well, Larry was like, ah, I don't just as, as as a Times employee. <laughs> as, as, as a Times employee, I'm going to disprove that, and he did because he went from like. The most recent mention of that, which was like two weeks ago, because everyone likes to talk about that, all the way back to the very first mention of it. And what he found was he found a picture of Otis's car, and then a picture of like the same car, which is this really unbelievably rare car. What it turned out to be was just a long horn. It was just a really weird car that its horn was above. It's like a 1911, you know, Smegley. So it was just a weird thing. The point being, uh, he was doing Wikipedia, and he wrote about Normandy Avenue, which ends in an IE, and then somebody changed it to Y, and he wrote the guy, and he's like, why did you do that? And he said, well, it just seemed wrong. <laughs> so there you go. That's Wikipedia in a nutshell. So again, don't believe everything you yeah, read. Well, don't do your, I'm sorry. Well, they did correct it. You know, that is the, the <laughs> Well, there are, of course, there are layers. It's supposed to suppress idiots. It's supposed to, in the end, add up to something. Yeah, well, it, but it adds up to a, if, if they correct something, and they correct it incorrectly, because the IE is correct for Normandy Avenue, then it just adds up to a mountain of idiots. And eventually, like, when you throw it back, does it take a million like people to just sit there? And which, which, which brings us to the fact that we're sitting in a college classroom, which is very much in the canon of academia, and there is a canon for public publishing histor and a historical monograph. So, Jim, do you want to tell us in? It's on my car. What? <laughs> <laughs> tell us, tell us in forty-five seconds, and of course, all your students know, but just for reiteration. The, the, the path for producing a correct historical monograph for publication, which of course will hopefully lead to your tenure, receiving tenure. Uh, right, if you're tenure track. If uh, you're tenure track. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's really pretty straightforward. You write an article with the manuscript, you send it off to the journal, and. And, but but within this manuscript, how do you citation and so so within the manuscript you support your evidence with Absolutely. citation. Like our, it's really no different than what our students do all the time. Of course, we put citations for for everything. Uh, you you find out what citation format that particular magazine wants. You trans, transfer them into whatever it is, uh, say Chicago style, and uh, you send it off and. No one generally is going to look up your citations, assuming you have the, you have the uh, uh, imprimatur of that PhD, and that's the whole point of the PhD. So that's, I guess, what you're getting at. That is what I'm getting at. Thank you. Yeah. You're a smart guy. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but there's this assumption that if if you uh, are a PhD historian, like for instance Newt Gingrich, that your, your, your footnotes are going to be uh, you know authentic and not making up. Now, if you get caught, uh, well, it depends how famous you are. But if you're caught and not famous, you can get into a lot of trouble for for uh, uh, footnote fraud uh, and particularly plagiarization. But uh, but also for just misinterpretation, you can get into some degree of trouble too. And so that's and, and, and this versus Wikipedia and sort of the so what what, I, what I'm trying to quickly get to and then we'll we'll leave it and I want to get on to video games. What I'm trying to get to is is the internet brings us this notion of a trust metric that that out there 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 are millions of people on the internet and Wikipedia has a built-in trust metric, however well or however poorly it works. The trust metric is that anyone can edit a Wikipedia page. Uh, you need, I, I guess, is, there's some sort of threshold of what when you can do edits. 
And that's very different than the trust metric that you've just described of that of, PhD, of, of a PhD tenured professor at a university. But now at Wikipedia, I mean, this is still a little bit off track, but, but maybe it's, it's correct, because we're talking about historiography and the way in which we all can be involved in historiography nowadays. Uh, Wikipedia has all kinds of systems now which uh, basically require you to, on the discussion pages, start showing your sources. Trust, trust metrics, yeah, of course. And, and anything uh, that's vaguely controversial or well uh, fleshed out in Wikipedia will be locked down, so yep. that making changes becomes actually quite difficult. You have to get them pre-approved in discussion. But it, so you can make a Wikipedia page about nothing very easily. In other words, a subject that isn't already in Wikipedia, this is a growth strategy for Wikipedia. But once these things get filled in, you need more and more evidence and more and more kind of documentation. Uh, but, you know, of course, but no one, as we said, no one, I mean, my, my book has 150 pages of footnotes in it. And uh, endnotes in it. And I don't think the University of California Press had the money to <laughs> check any of them at all. I mean, they checked the format. Right. And they made them consistent with the bibliography, and I was impressed that they did that. But it's not like they went and said, well, is that the really exact quote? That was based on, on faith. Uh, you know, and, I, and I take personal pride in the fact that I think I got every footnote exactly right. But you know, that's just because I'm uptight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that, that okay, we're a little uptight. Then we'll go. Then the thing about me, you can be as OCD, or kids, you can be as OCD as you want about footnotes, but ultimately it's about your confirmation bias. We're yeah. confirmation bias. If you yeah. go into something thinking you want to prove a point, that's not writing history. What you really want to do is go into thinking like, I'm going to disprove my point. I'm going to throw away all my, and then hopefully maybe you will, maybe you won't. But you know, like I don't know if you, David Irving is a, is a famous uh, historian, he's a, a Holocaust denier, and I don't think he ever goes into every single book going like, no, this time I'm really going to prove there was a holocaust. And he goes, darn it, there just isn't one. No, I think he really goes in there saying like, damn Jews trying to make up an Israel. Well, Nathan. well this, this is my point. This is important. Is He said in quotes. <laughs> I said in quotes. That's right. There were bunny years. Um, pseudo history is basically any history that's written with, um, it's not that your footnotes are wrong or anything like that. It's just an, an overemphasis on certain things, things taken out of context. I could, I could sit down and write why Atlantis existed, and it would sound really good. And I bet I could turn it into some hoity-toity uh, professors wearing you know, silk top hats and have monocles and be like, well, yeah, it's very well written. It must be, you know, we're not going to check the footnotes, so it must be in Atlantis. But you know, that's how a lot of history is written. And God willing, that's not how we wrote ours. Uh, I think we you know, left no stone unturned. We, we looked at a lot of stuff about, for example, Bunker Hill um, that I think wasn't looked at before. There were a lot of, see, I'm getting back on Target, aren't I, Richard? You are. Uh, there you go. What's the name of your, of your post on uh, Bunker Hill, on the, <laughs> the L.A. Noir? Oh, um, it's like the, if you go to bunkerhill.org, it's like the third one down. It's not. Kim, why isn't it the third one down? Why don't you use Google? It is. <laughs> yeah, you could easily use Google. Also, I'm going to show this to my students. Oh, you know, it's not on. It's not on Bunker Hill. It's on uh, Forest Hill Project. Oh, that's oh. why. That's oh, why. So yeah. you look for that. And I'll keep. What was that going on about? Oh, right. The idea of Bunker Hill was that um, the city, the CRA, the Community Redevelopment Agency, started in 1940. I'm sure you read. It. You guys, you, your homework was to read all this stuff, right? <laughs> some, some of it. Some of it. Well, I'll tell you some of it. The 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 prevailing wisdom for people over the course of the years has been because this is what we were taught by the city and we have to believe the city because they have a big building downtown that's shaped like that. So we believe them. Um, that it was this terrible slum and you have to get rid of slums because slums are bad because the ch what about the children and la 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 and there was crime and da 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 so we had to tear it down and you know what Bunker Hill looks like now it's got big towns and say Wells Fargo on it and the CLRA was an autonomous taxing collective and they tore it all down and where did the 9,000 people go? Well, we don't really know because they all went away and they're like, we're going to build all your homes again in 10 years and it took like 30 years and they started building high-rise financial towers. Um, but the prevailing wisdom has always been it was because these places were slum. But you find someone like, we, we met this cat named Gordon Patterson who grew up there. You know, the more I looked at Bunker Hill, the more I realized, wow, they really took care of their houses. They really, there were lots of flowers, was mostly pensioners. There was kind of a higher crime rate, maybe, but you know what? It was really about the fact that the city didn't get the kind of tax money back. They were putting so much into ambulances and fire engines, mostly. Well, it's even beyond that. The city it wanted it to it turn dangerous. Bunker Hill into the civic center. That Harry Chandler, in the 19, in the 1915, decided that 
northern downtown was going to be the second largest collection of federal buildings outside of Washington, D.C. And, and that's why Bunker Hill was chosen, mm -hmm. in, in a nutshell. And they made arguments for the tax base and the CRA used the tax base as a tool, but basically Harry Chandler decided to do this and he did it. But, yeah. Right around the same time they were doing all thing with the Owens River Valley. Yeah. The point being, I mean, they were, you know, what I found out was everything you were told was a lie, you know? We have to lie. Just for context, we read Conditions of Blight from 1947, House Angler Report. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Right, and the propaganda behind that by hiring Nadell, who was the New York photographer. Um, you know, they've sunk a bunch of money into yeah. getting some really good photographers from out of the state to come in and, and, about house and show pick right yeah. and, and, and portray the Conditions of Blight, which is just pure propaganda. I mean, you know, I mean, Gorey wouldn't have done, couldn't have, couldn't have done as good a job <laughs> as the city did. Nathan, tell everyone what's on the screen. Well, I'm sure you've all heard of Ellie Noir. Yes? Not, not actually, not until I brought this up. Uh, so. What these so, cookie kids have? When they're, they're actually studying. They're like, Game of Thrones? The rest of us. Um, <laughs> well, they made, yeah, this is, um, in, well, this is, a, this is a screen grab from the Ellie Noir game. There's Cole Phelps, and he's the main dude and you know we're looking at the fine arts there's walker and eisen's fine arts building yeah walker yeah. And eisen, we have walker and eisen tour and they're the barker brothers anyway oh it says that anyway point being um yeah in 2006 these guys say like oh my god we're going to do a video game and it's going to be like this beautiful perfect uh recreation of 1947 in los angeles and so, the reason they wanted to choose 1947 los angeles is because is because it was one year after we'd written and it's going to go be about 1947 crime and it's like well I don't know where they're going to find all the stuff about 1947 crime. Oh, we just spent an entire year writing about 1947 crime. So, so the entire video game is just based on Kim's blog. And she would send them emails and say, hey, I think you're using my blog for the video game, which is really neat. Could we get copies or could we, like, could you buy us lunch and tell us how neat we are? And then they would ignore her. <laughs> That's not true. You wrote, the, you wrote them. No. Yeah, I thought you called them. <laughs> no. Um, no. Down in Australia? Yeah. Well, it was a joint, it was a... Uh, Rockstar is the parent company, and they're a couple of Brits uh, and their whole company. And uh, Team Bondi built it out. Yeah, they were Australian. Uh, 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 but so anyway, all yes. the narratives in the game are from the blog, 1947 Project. Oh, uh, a lot of, well, that is to say, I mean, well, we took them from the time. I mean, oh. And the, the Times took them from reality. So yes, they came from, you know, Laura Trellstad and Rosemary Mondragon, and of course the Dolly Murder, with which of course you are familiar. And, we're we're uh, going to get to that in a minute. Okay. Tell and them. The, tell them about your essay. So, so we got. So they called us finally, right? They called you back, and finally, what? In, in, I'd never contacted them before, Richard. Okay. Well, they reached out to you. They did. And they were. So they said. So I said. They said, "Come and come and come and play." So they had this. This big old room at the Roosevelt and poolside, half naked women, a lot of half -naked. sandwiches, beer, <laughs> and uh, yeah, a lot of mountains of coke. We were like, oh, <laughs> that's all they've seen of our face. That's, that's, that's not true. <laughs> it's not true. That's true. Alleged mountains of coke. No, point being, um, they said, well, c come on and play it. It's going to be fun for you guys because you guys like did all the stuff about 47 in LA. We're like, okay, cool. And I said, like, so it's cool. And uh, yeah, you know, we do this blog about it. So. We might do to build the game. You know, and they're like, yeah, come and play it. So we're playing, I'm like, oh, this is going to be great to blog about this. And then I'm leaving, I'm like, so I'm going to, so it's, it was like, you know, Friday at 5 o'clock. I'm like, so Monday morning is going to be a blog post about it. And they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. So by like Tuesday afternoon, the blog post goes up and like this poop storm, see, language, comes down and they're like, I can't believe you did this. Because basically I called them out and I said, you know, Perfect recreation, huh? I mean, there, there's certain. Now, don't get me wrong. I love this game. I love playing it. I play it to this. I don't play it as much. I do the free roam and I look at stuff and I go, ah. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I really love about let's, it. There's let's, a lot let's. of stuff they got wrong about it. So again, it's about the, the creation of this world and the way in which uh, they were, you know, building this simulacrum. Um, we're gonna get to that in a minute. What did they do to try and dissuade you to take your blog post down, which is disparaging against them? They had a woman call you after midnight. I'm, you know what, I'm just not going to say. That's just between me that's and them, and that's just not important. That's right. Um, so Nathan, this blog post you wrote was about your experience with the game. But as historians, as, as, as the post stayed up, be unafraid, be fearless. That's right. Fight a good fight. So, so all this hype, this is recreated perfect 1947 Los Angeles. 
to their credit, they, it did actually finally come out a couple of months later and it had a little disclaimer on it that said like, oh, and by the way, this is not a recreation of anything, you know, don't, not real people, not real places, but it's, it's meant to evoke the style of it. It's meant to evoke the, the, the it's 1947 Isma. Uh, and it did. Tell us about Bunker Hill. So, so you played the game. And Bunker Hill, okay, I, I wouldn't have gotten my, my, yeah, if Bunker Hill hadn't been so, which is a particular and peculiar passion of mine, but they just, it was so egregiously wrong, and Bunker Hill Avenue was so wonderfully just missing, and so many buildings were gone. I mean, so many buildings that were so overly photographed. I mean, okay, the weirdest one, of course, is like, okay, third and grand, you've got the Nugent with its big old crazy tower, you've got the Lovejoy over here with its crenellated parapet, you've got Angel's Fly Pharmacy, and you've got this sort of, you know, one little, not nondescript building, but not a very off photographed building. That's the one that they actually got totally right. And, you know, God bless them, because, I mean, who would ever think that they would get the, what would that be, the sort of northwest uh, corner right? And the other three buildings, totally gone. I mean, uh, Lovejoy is sort of there in spirit, but it's missing all of its, uh, the other two are just completely, no. So it's like, Bunker Hill was terrible, it made me scream. Angel's Flight didn't even move. Um, you could on the flat though. And interestingly, uh, just to remind me later. What, got it. What, remind me later. What they most famously said was, uh, okay, and this this is instructive because this is about how one reads. That's why we're talking about this. How one reads Los Angeles. So yeah, right. I won't talk as much about my reading them as them reading Los Angeles. Exactly. That's what you guys are doing. You're reading Los Angeles. What they did in their research is they said. These are the ways that you get tricked up, and this is just, they tried, they failed, could have come to me and asked me, but well, maybe, maybe they called and I just didn't pick up that day. Maybe I thought it was like my dad calling, and I was like, oh, I'll pick it up later. It was them calling from Australia, and they called me once and said, oh, he didn't answer, and they hung up. But, you know, they famously say, well, one of the things we got so great about it is like, we got all of the topography right. We went to the U.S. Geological Survey, we got all the topography right, and blah, 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 but, you know, one of the things you do when you're going up, like, uh, Second Street, you know, here's Hill Street, to Olive, to Grand, to, you know, keeps going Bunker Hill Avenue, and then it goes down to, like, Hope, and then down to Flower, and then to Figueroa. But what it does in the game is it goes, you know, it's going up, and then it goes up to about Olive, and then it just flattens out and goes down. Because apparently what they did was they got modern topographical maps, mm -hmm. totally forgetting that that whole part was graded after 1947. It was graded, and of course, in the mid-late 60s, um, when they just tore the top off because it's a lot easier to build giant high rises that way. So they tried, but if you're doing they didn't try that hard. They must have because one of the things that, that came out afterwards is like all the people from Bondi were like, we're gonna sue you because we worked 80 hours a day for six years and you didn't even give us like credit or something like I don't know. Oh Nathan, what are we looking at? <laughs> I don't know why you're showing this, I'm just glad you are, because I love it so much. This is, this is the greatest thing in the entire world. Um, Archive.org? That's right. Yeah. Um, Where are we? This is, this is third? Oh yeah, no, this is Second Street. That's the top of the Second Street tunnel. Right, Second Street. Um, there's the Fashion League building that's gone. So we're this on Bunker Hill, right? Right? So we're on Bunker Hill, looking down there, and uh, it's so we're the Colburn School, basically. Yeah, actually, it's exactly where we are. Yeah, Colburn School would be right here, right where the Mission Apartments. Uh, are. And there's the northern, there's the Claridge, there's the northern. And what this is, this is process photography. This would be used, this is actually from a film called Shockproof uh, from 1949. This is shot in 48 for uh, Columbia. So I mean, this is a Harry Cohen joint. Yep. And um, so what it's doing is basically you, they were just filming driving around because then, you know, then they would put it like, then be in the car, you got like Helen Ladd like in front of it going like, We've yeah. got to solve this problem. And she goes, don't get shot, it'll be scared. It rolls yeah, under the Davenport, you go to Long Beach. <laughs> yeah, what if it lands on the edge? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> you go to Long Beach. You go to Long Beach. Um, it's not quite loading. It's loading. It's loading. So okay, so we're turning on the grand. So this oh, is and here's another thing. Everyone always talks. See that? Everyone always talks. That's another thing the CRA always told you is one of the reasons we had to turn on Bunker Hill, Hill is because there were never any new modern buildings built there. And what you just saw there was a 1940s streamlined modern building. And it's like, eh. so Nathan, we're on Grand, which at this point is 
the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion on the no, left. No, the, Dor yeah, the yeah, Dorothy, Dorothy Chandler is actually that. further yeah, this way. California Plaza, yeah, basically. because yeah, this is Cal Plaza because this is uh, that's Second Street. There's the dome, there's the front neck. Yeah, Cal Plaza is raising up this way. I think over here you got like the Wells Fargo Tower. Yep. And uh, so yeah, so actually no, because again, you'd be we're now 25 feet. Yeah. Down this. So all, all this, all this was all this was chopped off. Here's the famous. Uh, Nugent, Lovejoy, Angel's Flight Pharmacy. So Angel's three Flight was straight back there. Angel's Flight the was this way, yeah. Mm -hmm. And three buildings that are like, you know, very well documented that I have no idea why they didn't put in the game. I mean, it just, it just boggles the mind. So yeah. when you're playing the game and you're driving on Bunker Hill, you don't see this? No. You know, there are, there, are part, there are elements that you see. No, it looks very different. But it's, yeah. They're quite new. My apologies. It's okay, it's your girlfriend. Mm. She loves you. I know, she's very sweet. But she should know better than to call me all this. And there's this old, oh, I guess no, she would think that I was, never mind. And I dying. What are you doing? Shh. <coughs> and, um, we're actually going to watch most of this footage later on, too. So, so yeah, but what's really amazing is that, like, again, we have no idea this existed. And then some, like, Crazy guy was like, oh, put it on the I'll put it on the net, and then it just like blew up like crazy viral and went on to every like you know LA site. Probably like LAist was like one of the first yes, yes. I, uh, so Nathan, what does this mean to you as an historian of Bunker Hill? This this <coughs> unknown footage, which has just all of a sudden become available. You you can watch this, you can project this on your wall, and watch this frame by frame. How much information does it give you? And I do. It's a, it's a vast or well, well, yeah, this is like the, this is like the Citizen Kane of, oh, there's the, the saucy game. <laughs> oh, that is. The dishy games. Um, yeah, there's, there's one for one again. There is one. <laughs> like, for example, this gas station, like, no one ever photographed that because the dome was this way. Right. And that's the sort of thing, that's another thing. It's like, you know, the, the hidden histories of these buildings that no one ever looked at. Um, <clears throat> like, the one George Mann shot. Uh, where you've got, you know, everyone always shot, there was a big building called the Castle on Bunker Hill Avenue, and everyone always shot that because it looked like a castle, like this 325. George Mann shot the other side of the street, famously, in one of the shots, and I was just like, who ever saw that side of the street? I mean, these are the things, these are like the, the holy grails of Bunker Hill scholarship. And this raises the question of just sources, uh, even for something that, you know, we think we know people are Plenty of people around who remember Bunker Hill and this time period, and yet it's actually often quite hard to find legitimate sources on this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, well, the cool thing about the George Mann photos is the family had them, and they found our blog and asked if we wanted to put them right. out there, and now George Mann and his color photos have become one of the these iconic parts of representation of Bunker Hill. Yeah, so okay, let, let's, go back to this, let's go back to this feedback loop on the internet that I don't think quite exists in academia, yeah. which I think is, what, which is what, what makes the internet so interesting, is, is the own Bunker Hill blog started and had a, like an 18, about 18 months, Six or seven people worked pretty hard, and, and, and the bulk of the posts on, on Bunker Hill were about an 18 month period, Nathan? Okay? Yeah. Something like that? Two years? And then, about a, about 18 months after that, Kim, when were you contacted by the, the I man? Don't, I don't remember exactly. But it was about two, three years later. Yeah. So, after this, this the, all these blog posts about every building we could find on Bunker Hill have been percolating through Google and indexed. And, you know, we use a good content management system that does very good site indexes for Google. And you get contacted by the relatives, and they want to use this blog as a channel by which to promote George's great work on Bunker Hill. This is absolutely fantastic. I don't, I don't, you know, it's, it's just a really interesting <coughs> feedback loop. I don't know if it's exist, if, if, if this sort of, the, the, it's so fast, you know, it, it, Without the internet, it would take 10, 5, 10 years maybe? I don't know. I'm not sure what route it would be. Other way. You'd, you'd have to send the photos to a publisher and get them published in an art magazine, which would take a PhD, which would take a professor to write a letter to recommend that these are good footprints. Right. Exactly. I mean, if they, if they had enough 
red border code. I mean, the red border code of Chrome is the, <coughs> the god of all, you know, mid-century. Uh, someone like Charles Phoenix would write a letter of recommendation like that. I do nothing but publish books. So and and Charles Phoenix wouldn't exist without the internet. So you'd have to. Well, that's not true because he was that's true, publishing. He was, yeah. because that's the point. Is he was publishing these big hardback books. That's right. It may actually be more difficult for him now to publish yeah. those books. Speaking hypothetically, hello, Charles. Um, because of the internet, because so many people will just buy coded problems off the, off the eBay and just put them online now. But yeah, I mean, so the point is, like, who knows what's still out there? I mean, you know, but they're still finding shipwrecks at the bottom of the sea with great treasures. And I honestly couldn't care less about big, you know, chests full of doubloons. I mean, I'm sure they're very shiny, but... Uh, Actually, no, I would love one because I would just go buy a bunch of more Kodachromes in Bunker Hill um, the next time one shows up. So, so, so Nathan, what, what's the, what, I, I, let's assume that there are photographs of, of old Bunker Hill that are not as great as others. Let's assume that there might be some photos of Bunker Hill you might not have that much interest in. Are you, are you willing to, you're not willing to say that? The, no, what I'm saying is, well, these, well, no, I am willing to say that. There are many. And uh, these are the sort of things that, uh, these are the sort of value judgments that, this is why, and it's all grist for the mill. It's all grist for the mill. You can't make a judgment as to what is, thank you. Thank you. You can't make, you cannot make a judgment about what is good or not. Well, that's not my point. Because I'm a big believer in value judgments. So I'm a very opinionated person. Um, the point is, your, your trash, another man's treasure, a lot of the stuff I look at, a lot of the stuff I'm interested in, is when it comes to the debris pile, like it's really at the bottom of the debris pile. And there's a lot of Bunker Hill stuff that may be a second rate shot of something that you always see. Um, like Angel's Flight. Angel's Flight is probably, arguably, the most photographed piece of Bunker Hill. Because um, every, 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 every Schmendrick from Iowa came and had to shoot a shot of Angel's Flight. Went up in 1901, came down in 1969, and between that time there's 92 million, billion, trillion. I got a photograph of Angel's Flight. But, for example, when you shoot it looking, usually people shot it this way, uh, south on uh, Hill Street, you shoot it north on Hill Street, you're going to catch like the old YWCA, which became the Belmont Hotel, which is a personal fetish of mine. There uh, we go. Here's Angel's Flight. Exactly. Exactly. Tell, tell us what we're looking he at. He shot it this way. That drives me crazy. This is not my favorite view. This oh, is looking well, west on 3rd Street? So if you all know downtown, you know uh, the 3rd Street Tunnel, you're looking towards <coughs> the ocean, basically. Yeah, you're looking west on 3rd Street. And you'll probably know there's the very large, you know, sort of modular 1979-80 Dworsky built uh, Angeles <coughs> Plaza. It's a big old folks thing that I've, I, I honestly, I've, I've never seen anyone go in it or come out of it. So yeah. I'm, I have plenty of time. I'm thinking it's plenty just of people, people like that. Plenty of people like that. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I believe it may be the largest return. It, it is on the, in, in, nor, in, in, yeah, in North America. Yeah, because, you know, when there, you know, there were, there were 9,000 people on Bunker Hill, give or take. Um, the vast majority of them were pensioners, we're, and they were told we're, we're, talking, we're talking about good photos of Angel's Flight and Thank bad you. photos of Angel's Flight. He keeps me on track. He's a good boy. Uh, so yeah, so they always like to shoot it this way. You know, you've got the uh, the Ferguson Building, the Hubbard Building. This is your Elks Lodge up here. Um, what I always find it very interesting. The, for example, the the, the changes of this cafe, uh, the different signage it goes through. Um, the different lampposts that are here, you know, this one, this this sort of cobra, and what you know, you had those sort of five globe Llewellyns that were really, you know, early in Mitch, and then you had the twins. Um, you shoot it this way again, like as, as I was saying, you see the Belmont, and if you really get like sort of an oblique angle, you'll actually see the uh, fire station. Nobody ever shot that fire station. We're looking at today, which we found it's these four by yeah, which we found these four by six negatives of at the city archives today, mm. which I guarantee you have not been seen. He found, he found, he said like, hey, 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 someone look at this. I was like, ah! which I guarantee you, like, no one has looked at since probably uh, they were putting that envelope in 1930. So we're very excited, but that's okay. Let's take a deep breath, Jim. I'm going to ask you a question. So we've tried, and Nathan will try a little bit more to talk about the notion of what's a good photograph of Bunker Hill and a bad photograph of Bunker Hill. George Mann, who took this photo, who took all these photos, obviously a great photographer of Bunker Hill. When you start combing through the scrap pile, 
as an historian, what's what's what are what are some things you can use to figure out what's trash and what's what's I'm a real gem? I'm not the right person to ask this. But I'm just asking, asking you off the cuff. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. If my wife, she would say I'm I'm a collector, uh, <laughs> which I, I think you're a hoarder. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, my but my wife is one of archival sources, uh, and so yeah, I I certainly am one of those people who believes you should try to get as much of this data as you can, and then kind of once you're trying to make a specific project, you go through and try to make more sense of it. Uh, you know, obviously there's better and worse for a purpose. Uh, but better and worse in the abstract has to do with what purposes you have in your mind as you're looking at it. Uh, so, so obviously some things are, are going to seem richer than others, but it all has to do with what kind of case you're trying to make. You know, as a historian, you're trying to make an argument about the past, and uh, you're trying to support it with this kind of visual evidence that you're using as your evidence. So um, yeah, there's obviously there's better and worse, but it has a lot to do with what your perspective is for use value, uh, you know, and also an aesthetic value. Which is where the librarians come in, and I'm looking at yeah. two librarians here in the corner, <laughs> Dale and my wife. So Dale, I'm going to put you on the spot. Is there such a thing as a bad photograph? No. Absolutely <laughs> not. Right. Absolutely not. So so what do we do? We have to what what can people do to preserve this stuff, right? What, and well, specifically, what I'm trying to get at is LA is subject is the notion that Southern California as a county, as an area, has so many little deposits of all these individual communities which so desperately need to connect with other communities of interest to share. What, what do you do to try and preserve those? Well, I think one of the things you have to recognize is you can't save everything, but there is a network of people. So you have to say what is in your arena that you can do good work with. Right and connect with those other people. So that, in a sense, when I said there's no bad photograph, is really it's very, very difficult to be a curator and a librarian and an archivist. You can't keep everything, uh, otherwise we'd be sitting in all the Jackson and Flotsam from the 17th century. But, oh, you know, my wife is about to pass out. But, you know, yeah, <laughs> but, but now it actually is there because it actually deteriorates. It's all physical. So you actually do have to make some choices of what has the most information. But you also, I think the biggest thing for an archive or a library or the like is to sh let people know that you may have one thing, but there may be other places to get it. Uh, you just don't, you know, the, and the internet is actually not as big as you mm -hmm. get uh, mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, so you still have to dig around. So I, uh, is that enough of answering that? that yeah, it's really absolutely. It's very, very hard to say what's good or bad. You guys did, though. So you yeah. are on the spot. You're the ones that are saying what's a good photograph, and I didn't know whether we were talking artistically. I think you really. I was just, I was just trying to just, it. I was just trying to get around the problem mm -hmm. space. No, Look at it. An archivist's opinion, an archivist's view. There is, there is no bad photograph from an archivist's point of view. From an historian's point of view, when you're trying to prove an argument, there are photographs that are of less interest to you than others, and and then every historian is going to assign a, a hierarchy in value. As you did, any photo, or or even a quote for a, from a primary source, you know, which which and exactly. And so so my point really is is that proper historical monographs are interesting and important. But I think something the internet can do is put out a lot of material quickly in one place to show people just the breadth and the scope of what's there. And I don't think historical monographs can do that. And I think that archives. As an, as, a, as, as an interface to the internet, need to work on that more too, to show, and I think some archives have done really good work in getting out there what's available for people to pick <coughs> over and start to talk about what, what works for them, what's a good photograph for this project, what's a bad photograph. <coughs> Go ahead. There's one more piece that comes with is just not the image, but the, the information that yeah. you have to glean from it. What you contribute is, it is you may be someone, we all may be sitting here, I don't know what date that is, I don't know when that happened, you could tell me that that's what Angel Flight looks like right now. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, we really have, a, when you talk about that responsibility, it's not the PhD that is the thing that confers the authenticity, it's a sense of trying to present the information. So that I think I mean, when it's so much harder to put the stuff online because you need the context. And the great thing, though, that I will support is that the internet allows other people to comment so that if, you know, that 
a digital archive that's up there, they can add, that's where the crowdsourcing really can work just Absolutely. as well in archives. Uh, and the policing of it, the Wikipedia concept that, you know, and the tagging things and adding mm -hmm. to it, those different perspectives, because it does enhance the information and value. And I was going to loop back to what we're talking about, about L.A. Noir, is uh, and our friends, the Australians down in Bondi, uh, that they thought that they could get the title insurance collection of photographs and a few other things, the aerial photographs, and that by looking at those pictures long enough, not knowing, I'm guessing, that much about L.A., other than maybe your blog at the time, that they would, uh, that they would be able to turn these photographs into that real landscape that they represent. Well, obviously, they should have talked to people who, like you guys, who could have said, what you're actually seeing in this photograph is more than you think you're seeing in that photograph. Right. You're seeing something very specific uh, and something that was about to change over time. Mm -hmm. Or let's take a look at the people on the street and see if there's something, this is obviously during uh, the suit riot, or that's something, you know, this isn't just a crowd, this is something significant. They didn't have that kind of context that you can have from the interpretive community that uh, that uh, certainly uh, uh, what you guys have tried to do uh, evokes so well. Uh, the the sources don't they they speak but they don't speak per particularly eloquently on their own. They do need a juxtaposition of other knowledge. Yeah. It's, uh, well, go ahead. I was just gonna say you know yeah, and now that's why there are specialists. That's why you've got a GP and. Well, you know, you hurt your hand and you go to a hand guy, and that'll be fine. Um, Dr. Redmond. Or Rafa Shem. I don't know a whole lot about, like, one, one, one of my um, blank spots is... What? You have a blank spot? What I, well, for me, it's not, I mean, I'm, I probably know more than Vin Scully, uh, to pull someone out of thin air, about maybe not the architectural right historian Vin Scully or the news, <laughs> yeah. the sports broadcast. I was purposely, uh, yeah. Okay, um, I know more than Lindsay Lohan about um, <laughs> red cars versus yellow cars. I'm not a specialist on it, but I know specialists about it. So I called these guys. And I was like, so they kind of like didn't quite get the whole red car, yellow car, and the, the transition yeah. between the overheads and the buses and the yeah. trackless trolley from the tracks. Did anybody call you? And I, I, I called up all these like, specialists, and they're like, no, no one called us. And it's like, did you hide? I mean, you're in the book. You're like the guys that are like, posting everywhere about this sort of thing. Like, oh, okay. So it's like you can go to these people. I mean, is it important <coughs> that, that L.A. Noir uh, got facts wrong? Uh, because, you know, you can certainly make the argument. Say that's actually that, a very good question. That's, that's, that's the only question. question. It's my job. The question uh, is, <laughs> yeah, the question remember is, that. The question is, so what? We, right, we, we, well, because you could said, you could talk about a different video game, Star Wars game. And then, are you, are you uh, going to all the things, going to all the experts, thank you, going to all the experts uh, who know about the, the Star Wars universe that has been visualized in various media, and that guy who just died, like, yesterday, who was uh, with the... Uh, the, 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 the artist, yeah, yeah, I don't know if I can remember his name, but, um, oh, you know, the, you can go back to those drawings, they all look different, but it gives you, a, I, so in other words, uh, you know, certainly the problem with L.A. Noir is that they made claims as they were developing for five years, mm -hmm. they spent, and it was, I was thinking, this is like the largest histor uh, budgeted historical research project on L.A. in the history of the city. Uh, you know. And it fails miserably. Well, uh, yeah. right. Well, let's we just step back and say, how much money was spent on trying to recreate LA? You know, we all wish we could have had that kind of budget, uh, and we would have done it very differently. Uh, but if they had to justify that they were making an investment like this, and so they their medium of justification wasn't that you're going to get to shoot people in a particularly good way, because the game mechanics are in no way novel or... or that interesting, really. Uh, so they decided they're going to use. We're going to evoke the uh, aura historically so well, and that's where they got themselves into trouble. But I'm not sure that that wasn't just uh, you know peripheral to the actual you know intense they had, which, as you say, was more mood style yeah. of 47 LA. If they had said we're saying something in post-war LA, we're going to try to make it look real, real good. You know, it's going to be romantic in this way. Then we probably wouldn't be judging them by the kind of the standards of historical authenticity that 
I, I, yeah, I told you, I'm a judgmental bastard. We were um, really anticipating it. I, especially Bunker Hill. They had billboards all over there. I mean, I'm not saying they didn't draw this on themselves. They did, and for their own reasons, because they, they're investors in the LA, you know, a lot of the money comes for the video games comes out of LA. And so this was a very clever idea. We're going to get Hollywood, uh, uh, and people who are interested in noir, and we're going to get uh, this video game industry who are interested in LA, probably, at least in, in a vague sense. Uh, and this is going to justify this huge investment in the five years we're going to take before this thing's going to hit the market. And they had to be floated and they had to all be paid uh, for those 80 hour weeks for all that time. Mm -hmm. And so that particular justification makes sense from their point of view, but now they're in trouble. Uh, but we wish that we could have created a historical simulation. This goes back to the question, do we really want, would this be a great project if we could hire you know, these people for 80 hour weeks and say, okay, uh, we want you to create a historical simulation that would be correct of what Los Angeles at least looked like on the surface mm -hmm. in 1947. And then, you know, we think about going to game manufacturers and say, we'll license out the setting for you or something Now you can like check somebody at the same time. But the, I mean, there are certain things that, of course, were great. Um, I think uh, they probably got all, you know, the Historic American Building Survey uh, right before they yeah, tore down the Richfield Building. Yeah. Um, which we talked about, actually. Yeah, famously, you know, they, they took a bunch of photos, they took a bunch of drawings, all those photos are online at very high resolution. They obviously saw those, because the Richfield building, mm -hmm. even though you can't go in it or anything, but it, it looks terrific. Yeah. Um, although they didn't actually have the, what the Richfield building used to do is it had Richfield on that oil yeah. derrick tower, and it used to go Richfield, and it used to go and flashlights, that doesn't do that, I don't know why. Because it doesn't do it in the Habs uh, picture. It doesn't do it in the Habs picture, so they didn't know yeah, that it did that. that. Yeah, that's like but nevertheless, I got to like drive down there and get out of the car and go, I'm standing at the Richfield building. Like, if you're in the screen. Actually, I do it on a little you know, Dumont network television this big, that's not important. Um, so Nathan, what's the importance of simulacrum? <sighs> don't tell me you're making a perfect simulacrum. I don't stop me for that long, exactly, if you're not going to... <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting question. What is the, yeah, okay. Could you ever actually really aspire to making the perfect? Right, I don't, exactly. Or how perfect can you be? You know, what's, what's the acceptable cutoff? I was saying they could have said, oh, it's, we're going to be vaguely noirish. And then they and could have said, a lot I think that was kind of part of their disclaimer. But it's, I think yeah, you made a very good point about, like, it's kind of like the Star Wars universe. If you did a Star Wars game and you put a do back on Hoth, and they're really only on Tatooine, and all they're like the 53 guys who would get really wanky about it. Be like, I can't believe you did that. You can't put a do back on Hoth, you know? And they'd be like, Yeah, we just spent 28 billion dollars on this game. We don't really care. You know, we we just moved because because if you press a jack in the middle of the game, it'll actually start where you where you hit a jack, and that's all we care about. Because yeah. if if, if your your five year old hits the eject button while you're playing at the 18th level. And you, and you put it back in, it'll just pick up and you won't lose it. That's we what we care really about. Are yeah. And that's what video game engineers care about. So, and then, I mean, honestly, they, maybe they work harder on the Star Wars world than on the 1947 world, because they figured, you know, everyone's been to the Star Wars world, but, you know, the 47 world, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. who's been there? Especially from the perspective of uh, Sydney, suburbs of Sydney. You know. Yeah. Yeah, but it was a little like they looked at it. Uh, there, there's some funny parts though about it because it, 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 one, instead of talking about like a clip, they talk about like an escarpment or whatever, mm -hmm. and then tire they spell like T Y R E on a thing. I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure we don't spell it that way. <laughs> <laughs> 47. Not even like 47. Dale, I want you to tell us about the archive bazaar, <laughs> which is coming up. No, is that a good transition for you guys? Well, I think it's, 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 it ties it's, it's into all, all of this well. because because we're talking about L A S. L A S. So. We're talking about the simulacrum of Los Angeles, right? How can can you represent Los Angeles? Can you can can is there enough information in all the little archives throughout Southern California to represent Los Angeles? If only in the course of no, but but can you try, how how would you try to represent Los Angeles through a collection of localized archives in Los Angeles? And that's where the archive bazaar, I think, attempts to answer that question. Well, I'm thinking it through. First of all, just so you know, the uh, Los Angeles uh, as subject, which they've mentioned several times and probably introduced it, we're actually a member of it. This whole purpose was is that you know archives are power. Uh, that which is preserved is what uh, is valued, and depends on who preserves it. So I say that because one of the goals of LA as subject was to bootstrap small collections that would represent much, much more the fabric of this city, whether it was small collectors 
one, one person, you know, what do you do with your stuff when your kids don't want it? Uh, big question for Professor Axelrod <laughs> that he's going to be faced with. But the whole notion of photographs of people, and there are, you know, the idea of how much, you know, how many scrapbooks of the average middle class family can you have, speaking of Charles Phoenix, uh, <laughs> that has made a living out of actually going, oh, isn't this a 1954 swimming pool rate? I digress. The point of all those different perspectives uh, is the need to preserve it. So you can't ever be the same repository. Anyone that says, oh, go up to Special Collection at Occidental, they have everything. Uh, we don't. And we only may have a little portion of the story. And no one really, uh, what you need is to create and have the space so that people that do research, that can interpret material, can get to those kind of physical collections. And they won't be here if you don't preserve it. So that's the first goal of LA's subject, is believe it or not, for a small college, we have more resources than some of the other 250 members of LA's subject. And we also bring together researchers recently. Uh, there used to be just the groups of people that had stuff. So, you know, some people collect a lot of ephemera on Orange County, and all of the, you know, those materials are so often, I'm just using one as an example, the stuff of life and how to recreate it. There may be photographs, there may be films. And so the LA, what is an opportunity is the more you follow a group like LA Subject, we have a bazaar in October that is part of Archives Month. And it doesn't have enough space to hold all the members from all over the Southern California region. And we actually, the California State Archives is a member because they have stuff on the LA. So you have this whole range of different perspectives, different people. Uh, you, you get to, uh, in, in this case, this bazaar physically brings together the people. Our directory brings together ways to get to the other archives. And that way, the bazaar, if you were to really say, could, this, could I piece together Los Angeles, you have a little bit of a start. Uh, the other thing is piecing together the people of Los Angeles and capturing them as well. That yes, that's what the bazaar that's, is? So yeah, we're always ha hawking that to you guys but, but, to come but, on back. But then there's there's this the, the bigger notion, which is the promise of the internet, and I don't which which it's the promise of the internet and the support of academic institutions like Occidental and USC to the archive bazaar. There is the notion of this connective tissue to all these institutions to at, let anyone get at this information. The, the the point the internet doesn't mean anything. The internet is just this tool, and I really think behind everything that, that Kim and Nathan and I do is, is we're trying to disseminate information. And this is really, I think, where we get upset about L.A. Noir, the video game, is its dissemination of bad information. And that's what's really upsetting us, is it's bad information. The point of, every, of, of the internet, the reason everyone is so interested in it, is that the internet disseminates information better than anything else has ever done in the history of mankind. The civil rights movement in this country, which was in the mid-60s, more things, I believe, changed in this country faster at that point than any time else in the history of this country because so many different types of people came together. They got on buses from all over the country and they came to the South and they met all these different people with all these different ideas and they came back totally transformed because they watched someone they'd spent four hours talking to on a bus get their skull cracked open and go to a hospital for a month when they walked off the bus in Alabama. And they go back home and like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened, we have to change this. And I think the internet does that. The internet lets all these people with all this specialized information connect. And I think the Archive Bazaar is a great microcosm of that. And the goal is to let all these groups of specialized information share it with the general public and figure out, oh, I really want to go, I really want to talk to Wally. <laughs> Wally's the red car guy, and I really need to talk to Wally because this is a red car question for Wally. But no, then I'm done with that. I really actually want to go to the booth and talk to Nathan because I have this question about about this service station at Sunset Boulevard, just west of Beaudry. And I know that Nathan's going to have the answer to that question. And, and I think that, the, that, the, that, that why things are so interesting that the internet has the promise that this is actually tenable. We can actually like, get to this point. Not just at the Archive Bazaar once a year, but, but online. You can get to these people and find this specialized information and, and disseminate good information. Because I think we all get I think we all like good information. 
I think we all want the, the, the truth to be told. I think I think I think there is truth with a truth with a capital T. Oh my god. I, I, I don't, yeah, you can't, you can't even start on that. That's 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 a tricky question. But you know, this this goes to reading and writing Los Angeles and uh, there's reason why it's called reading and writing Los Angeles. And I think it does go back to what you guys are doing that is so important, <coughs> is that you're not just uh, collecting information, you are interpreting and publishing it and yeah. adding a layer of analysis. <laughs> Uh, and as we said, the internet. Oh, is, Chavez Ravine, right? Uh, well, we're talking about Chavez Ravine uh, on Thursday, and uh, oh. yeah, so nice. if you're in anything you wanna. Okay. 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 Very much like Bunker Hill is the place where you know it was seen as blighted. It's another of those blighted districts, another place that got wiped out around the same time, and uh, yet we do have you know they do pop up things partly to the internet, partly to other people's just work. Uh, these pictures that have come out, for instance, in the last decades. So. Chavez Ravine and the communities there. Let's, 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 talk, let's talk about what's behind us. Okay, so yeah. let's talk about Chavez Ravine for a second. So, so this is stuff we put, so Nathan, tell them about the URM, Union Rescue Mission. So, who knows who, what the Union Rescue Mission is? Downtown, 6th and San Pedro? <laughs> the, the rescue mission, Skid Row, right? People get off the train, get off the bus, get thrown out of the house, they're destitute, they go to the Union Rescue Mission, they get a meal, they get a bed, they get a sermon. Their life is changed by God somehow. Specifically, they work through Jesus Christ. God bless them. Um, Nathan, I have. URM has been there since 1882. Yeah. They have an archive. They're more interdenominational now. Uh, 1892. This is an archive that has been continuously held since 1892 of life on Skid Row. Completely fascinating, and, we, and Kim found it. Yay, Kim. So we started to blog about it, and we went down, well, we started blog. We said, well, they have to have an archive. We're going to submit a presentation for this mm -hmm. at the Archive Bazaar. We said they have to have an archive, right? They've been around since 1892. And they and wrote their own history in the early 50s. Yeah, so they wrote their own history. So they have to have an archive because they have this pretty interesting history in the 1950s. And so we went down, we called, we, we, I emailed them, and they said, yeah, we have an archivist. She wrote me back. She said, yes, of course we have an archive. There's an entire room. You should come down and look at it. And we get there, and it, we're like in shock because they're just, they're just file cabinets of photos and testimonials. And we're gonna, we're, I, think, I think, Nathan, you, you, you fainted at some point. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and the archivist lives at some point in about 10 minutes into our visit says, oh, have you seen our film? And we say, what film? And she says, well, you know, we made this film in 1949 in front of the mission. And these are stills from the film. It's like, so they have, they have this five minute footage at the beginning of the film of just Main Street in 1949, which is the emotional half acre of everything Kim and Nathan and I do. And, it, and it's in color and it's unbelievable. And we're watching it and just like, we can't even watch the whole film because we're so impressed. And so we're getting to shop as a ring. So, so one of the things we do, and, and I leave this as an exercise to you guys, with, with found footage. So you take this film and you start looking at slides, stills of it, and you, and you say, well, okay, so I want to look at the notion of how the impact of transience on public policy, how public policy impacts transience, and how public policy impacts the notion of blight and imminent domain and redevelopment, and, and what role, what tools public policy has to implement that. So here's a scene of an LA of a black Mariah. This is an LAPD uh, paddy wagon, where they arrest people and throw them in it. This is an LAPD officer taking a bum, an older white rummy, and throwing them in the back of the wagon and, and booking him. In the lower part of the screen, this is a photo of an LA County Sheriff's deputy on Fifth Street, on Second Street, Second Street, just south of Maine. Uh, he's just thrown another older white male rummy into the back of this car, and they're driving up to the Hall of Justice at Temple and Broadway. Okay, so, so just the compare and contrast of the LAPD versus the LA County Sheriffs is fascinating, but I won't go into that. What we're interested in here, and this goes back to Chavez Ravine, you watch the film footage, and it shows an LAPD officer arresting this white rummy, and it shows, and this is just the, still at the end of it, the LASD deputy arresting this white rummy. What's the difference and what's the methodology and why is this interesting? The bum that was laying on this street corner got handed a citation by a county health officer 
two minutes before this patrol car with two LASD deputies that had pulled up. He had the citation in his hand or next to him. The LASD deputies get out of the car, walk up to the man who has a citation for transients. They arrest him on the transient citation from the health officials, from the health official, and they take him up to the Hall of Justice, which is exactly what they did at Chavez Ravine. That is how the county sheriff's department, who was ordered to clear Chavez Ravine, cleared it. Is the county health department came in and issued citations for transients or blight, whatever, whatever code they, they claimed they were breaking. They issued citations, they sent them in the mail, they issued them 20 minutes for the LASD. Wagons pulled up and the people just looked at them like they were crazy and then the sheriff's deputies came in and arrested all of them. And so that, that's really interesting to me. It's really interesting, the methodology by which the county goes ahead and implements this. And it's all right there on film. So, Chavez Ravine, so that's, the, that's, that's my tail end for Chavez Ravine. I, I don't know, Jim, I think, uh, are there any questions? We should, ask, we should ask questions. Are there any questions? We like, you like doing this, Nathan? We love doing this. You know, I, I'm just thinking, you know, by the way, this and is a, this is a this is a green uniform. It's just the uh, the nitrate print was disintegrating. And here's the Higgins building. How many of you guys yeah, like to uh, go out and say this the Higgins building? That's the Higgins building. Where's the Edison? That's where the Edison is. But you know what? You know what? In 20 years, you know what they're they're going to have to deal with that it never got filmed. Yep. It was all the thousands and thousands of people who through eminent domain got their homes taken away, they got torn down. LUSD. Yeah. LUSD in the last 20 years, the most arguably mismanaged and corrupt. Taxpayer funded, a bunch of naked boops who basically just they just go take anybody's home. To the most famous for me, the uh, uh, 1936 KEHE building by Stiles Clements, 141 North Vermont, and we took it and said they were going to you know reuse the facade, never did, tore it down. The Ambassador Hotel, we won't even talk about, which they actually did as sort of a gaslight shell game so they could tear down a bunch of other buildings. Point, you know, and it could happen to you. Don't forget that. So this is why. Here's my concluding thought. This is why we study history. As blah blah blah, do no repeat. What did um, What did your mother say when she proposed to your father? <laughs> I think she said, "Then I think we should get married." Oh no! <laughs> you know what? <laughs> uh, we're that, Yeah, that's right. She said, um, "She put it." Uh, I'm, I'm that way, when the Nazis I'm come, going to convert. Yeah, because when the Nazis come back, they have to take us both. <laughs> She, I, she meant it. I'm, I'm seriously I'm happy. Nice and disappearing girl from New Orleans. When they come back, they'll have to take us both. They're coming back. Don't think they're not, guys, okay? <laughs> it's up to you. You gotta, you gotta stay on top of things. That's why we're historians. Okay. We study this stuff. I know it's a big thing. Is history cyclical? Is it linear? Doesn't matter. Either way. They're coming they're back. back. <laughs> so you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta get your guns ready. And you're right. Yeah, the story of the freeways is another thing. You said all about Fort Moore and the way in which they... Uh, oh, yeah. They put up a flag. <laughs> well, they put up a plaque. <laughs> so are there any questions? You guys like, you want to ask us what we do for fun? This is what we do for fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's, not, that's not what we do, Nathan. No, that's not what we do. We drink tea. See, we're tea toddlers. That's right. Tea. What do you guys it's read? What, what are, what are, Nathan, what books do you guys read? Bonnie. Bonnie? Bonnie, Bonnie it's good. Excellent. We have to read. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> These guys are instrumental in lighting this courtyard apartment. That's right. We like Bukowski. Yeah. Fonte, anyone read John Fonte? Good to jump. Yes. Yeah. All right, well, you guys, so, so what do you read in this class? Yeah. So, reading, so, reading and write, so what do you read in this class? This is called Reading and Writing Los Angeles. We have the syllabus. Uh, okay, well, I, I okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come prepare. What, what have been your favorite things so far that you've read in this class? Yeah. Yeah. Jack Webb. Jack Webb. Kim, tell us about Jack Webb. Tell us about Jack Webb and his lies. <laughs> Jack Webb spent a lot of time hanging out with cops and just getting sort of an oral history of crimes that had happened about 10 years earlier. And in many cases, give, they give, were... Give us a time frame and what he was, why he was doing this. He was writing around 58, 57. He was mostly talking to old timers who were interested in both very, very hot recent cases and historical LA cases. And in many cases, he wasn't talking to the actual detectives who had worked the cases. He was sort of getting the perceived wisdom of other law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. And he was also filling in some of the gaps as he wrote as a fiction writer, as a filmmaker. 
Um, so some really interesting falsehoods about LA slip in because he wanted to make everything fit together. And it just doesn't work that way. And I, th I think we were the first, the first chapter of the badge. So. Yeah, see, the, the badge is interesting because the dragnet became... Okay, this is why history is important. Because, because the communist scare that gripped this country, that almost sent poor Nathan's father to prison, no joke, no joke, which gripped this country in the late 50s, this was, this was facilitated, I believe, entirely by local Los Angeles politics. Chief Parker gave Jack Webb, Chief Parker worked out with the network that produced Dragnet. They had carte blanche, they could look at anything in the LAPD files, because Dragnet, the television show, perpetuated the notion that labor is bad, communists are evil, and this is entirely this mindset that came out of Los Angeles with the Los Angeles Times bombing from 1910. So I would argue the mania that gripped this country about communism in the 50s and early 60s is entirely a result of Jack Webb and Chief Parker pushing this psychotic notion of how Los Angeles was supposed to be in 1920 to preserve land values. Mm. And, and, and it almost ruined the country. And Chavez Ravine is part of that, because they were, they, they were really moving those people out, again, like Bunker Hill, to build a very large public housing project. And then they realized that, what is public housing? Public, what is public? Communism! <laughs> and plus we needed the Dodgers, because, you know, they're hitting balls with sticks in this. So, so, it's, so it's, it's important to get it right, because, because the, the, the badge is wrong. And it's wrong. It's wrong in a lot of ways. And everyone thinks it's right. And like the, like the doorman at the building. Yeah. The little things. It's not doorman. The big things too. So so that, so Jack Webb. So Jack Webb famously grew up on Bunker Hill. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. We talked about that a little bit. Oh. Really, and you know Jack Webb, honestly, cool cat. Really into jazz. Yeah. Really into that Utrecht jazz. Actually, the neatest thing about Jack Webb and Dragnet is the whole thing comes out of a real 1946 murder spree. There was a film made of the machine gun Walker case. Right. Jack Webb yeah. played the role, basically, of Ray Pinker, who was the um, police forensic, forensic scientist, scientist. The, really the originator of forensic science in the LAPD. He loved playing this role, and he ended up developing it into a character from which he became the detective. So if it wasn't for a real, completely outrageous LA crime getting made into this great Anthony Mann film, maybe we wouldn't have Dragnet. That's on archive.org. That's, they that's forgot the copyright. It's the damn. It's in the thing. public domain, so yeah. you can watch that tonight when you're not doing your homework. <laughs> Which I encourage you to do is watch old films on archive when you're not doing your homework. That's what I do. Just pretend it's your homework. Did we do okay, Jim? What do you think? Yeah. Did we keep them? Very I, well, I, don't, very I think well. everyone's vaguely interested. Well, I've raised a lot of interesting questions about. That's what we're here to do. Raise uh, no answers. Yes, well, exactly. <laughs> no answers. Well, interesting thoughts about. Uh, about uh, you know some of these people you've talked about, uh, with Walter Benjamin, for instance, this idea of uh, uh, well, first of all, this uh, kind of living in the environment of, of, of place, and can you kind of recreate it? Can you recreate the uh, the sensibility? You know, there's a lot of, we've talked in a little bit about uh, you know, can we get these facts of the past correct? Mm -hmm. But you know. From my point, of, from my point of view, I'm always more interested in getting the ideas. Uh, you know, we certainly have gotten uh, some windows into these moral panics uh, and other kind of more official discourses. But what about the ones, uh, you know, consciousness of various people, the con contesting and uh, differing uh, mindsets? And that stuff is much harder to get at. Uh, yeah. We use cultural forms mostly as our only good window into that. Uh, and I don't think there's a good way uh, in a quick time to ever find these things out, but I think, the, you know, everyone's uh, doing a little of that themselves. The students are right now turning in uh, these historical fictions they wrote, which are basically oh. set in the background. So the, I think there's something to say by using the imagination. I was very uh, impressed with, with what you said just starting off. You know, there's imagination combined with facticity. Yeah. Uh, we try to get, you know, maybe that is the problem with LA Noir, they're a little, a little bit lazy in their facticity. Uh, also, the imagination is a little bit shaky. Oh, okay. Too. So, <laughs> from the game, come on. Yeah. From the game. Yeah, I am taking issue with the diegetic structure. 
spent all that money on it. They could have had two-story conferences. So I'm very pleased uh, by, by your presentation, and I hope, uh, I I hope you guys have fun. It's, it's been a pleasure and an honor. And if you, if you guys watch one noir film on archive.org when you're supposed to be doing your homework, we've done a good job. <laughs> Well, we're, we're going to watch several in the second half of the class, although I can't remember if they're all archive.org. So. The good, well, all the good ones. Good, there are lots of good ones on archive.org. Good, I, I should look there. Yeah? You're going to watch Kiss Me Deadly? Uh, that's not on archive.org. I'm just going to gonna say, excuse me? That's, <laughs> not, on, that's not on archive.org. I just wonder what they're going to watch it. It's got really good Bunker Hill stuff in it. They all do. We're going to do Act of Violence. Act of Violence. Act of Violence, act of violence yeah, is fantastic. Bunker Hill footage, yeah. Yeah, that's one yeah. of the reasons why I chose it. Actually. Yeah, act of, act of Violence is great, yeah. Yeah, you, guys, you guys are gonna have fun. <laughs> Grow up and you know become like us or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Don't do it. Leave now. Well, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. Uh, if I had yeah, known no. you were gonna be here, I would have made a bigger deal about that. Oh, oh no, she she she, she 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 likes to be under the radar. That's her mo. Oh, I see. She she sits back and thinks. And, and it makes cryptic comments on the drive home. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. No, she's going to make a cryptic uh, tweet about this. That's right. <laughs> That's right. She's going to have a very cryptic tweet. It's very fun. You guys study hard, have fun, stay in trouble. It's yeah. Tuesday, right? Yeah. It's the beginning of the week. Well, we, we know all about yeah. the good. Yeah. And, and if you can't be good, be careful.